and welcome to this important uh, lecture series of uh, indian uh, council of agriculture research uh, to celebrate a very uh, noble cause and that is uh, to celebrate the azadi ka amrit mahotsav the golden 75 years of india's independence friends in this series we have a very important lecture today and uh, that is uh, none other than sadguru for uh, saving the soil a, a biggest uh, movement on this art to say this soil uh, i welcome on behalf of indian council of agriculture research on behalf of all the agriculture universities to uh, sadguru uh, to agree to deliver this uh, interactive uh, discussion uh, to respond to the uh, questions uh, friends uh, sadguru uh, who is the founder of uh, isa foundation and the proponent of the safe soil movement uh, across the world Uh, he is also a spiritual leader and a yoga guru so we welcome him uh, on this important platform uh, before uh, i invite uh, sadguru uh, for uh, taking up uh, our uh, questions i will request uh, to play a important uh, video about the introduction uh, about this whole movement and uh, that is a short video on the world's largest movement uh, people's movement to save the soil Uh, led by sadguru a mystic and visionary and founder of isa foundation the movement touched over 3.9 billion people across the planet so may i request to please play the video <clears throat> and global warming and various other aspects but we are not addressing soil Soil is the habitat upon which zillions of lives thrive. Once there is no richness in soil, then you have forsaken the planet in many ways. Every responsible scientist in the world and the UN agencies are clearly saying we have only 80 to 100 harvests left. That means approximately 45 to 50 years of agricultural soil left on the planet. By 2045 we will be producing 40% less food than what we are producing right now and our populations will be 9.3 billion people the food shortages that could manifest in the next 25 years the consequences of that is unimaginable civil wars will unfold across the world once there is food shortage what we are facing now is soil extinction Why is soil becoming extinct? Where is it going away? What is happening to our soil? We must understand if you add organic content to sand, sand will turn into soil. If you remove all organic content from the soil, soil will become sand. In normal agricultural soil, the minimum organic content should be between 3 to 6%. the most minimum is 3% at least this minimum to keep the soil alive to keep the soil as living soil is a must agricultural soils across the world the depletion is so heavy in most countries more than 50% of the top soil is already gone in the last 100 years the nutrient levels have dropped significantly the level of micronutrients you would get from your food in early 20th century to what you are getting from the same food now has dropped 90% if you ate one orange in 1920s what you got from it now in 2020 if you have to get the same you will have to eat eight oranges this is what we have done to our food Soil is the biggest ecosystem on the planet and so few people know anything about it. One teaspoon of healthy soil probably contains more microbes than there are people on earth. The microbial life in the first 12 to 15 inches of top soil is the basis of our existence. It is this magic beneath our feet which has produced the life that we are. this first 12 to 15 inches of soil is the basis of life for 87% of life on this planet including you and me we have to begin to recognize that what we call our soil mother earth 
is a living organism. Open soils, ripped open by plowing, open to sunlight, is the basis of destruction of microbial life. So the focus should be on agriculture, the focus should be on seeing that land is under shade as much as possible. Some kind of shade, grasses, herbs, bushes, trees, so it's extremely important that soil regeneration is enshrined in the policy of every government on the planet. We must change the narrative on the planet that soil is a wealth, a legacy we have received from previous generations and we have to pass it on as living soil for future generations. We are in a cusp of time, if you do the right things now, in the next fifteen to twenty-five years, we can significantly turn this situation around and regenerate the soil. But if we allow this to progress like this for another thirty to forty years, after forty years if we attempt this, then it could take hundred and fifty to two hundred years because that much loss of biodiversity would have happened. From twenty-first of March for one hundred days, the whole world, every human being on the planet should talk soil. We must hear the word soil, save soil everywhere to see that the narrative on the planet changes towards the most vital aspect of our life, the soil. Each one of you should reach as many people as you can to make this happen as a part of this, to activate support from the citizenry, to assure the governments long-term investments will be appreciated. <laughs> I'm sixty-five and I'm riding thirty thousand kilometers, a lone motorcycle journey, thirty thousand kilometers across twenty-four nations. Sadhguru, thank you for what you're doing. Dear Sadhguru, one of the world's voices and leaders on soil conservation. As for the Muslim World League, we are completely ready to help you. Uh, you've inspired me to think about soil very differently. I love what you say that we're all part of the solution and we all have a role to play. This is my appeal to every one of you because I don't want this COP15 to end as one more convention with more paper and more paper. This must end with concrete action, an action in such a way that is it's implementable. It is implementable and we will see a distinct change in the coming few years. perfect confluence of, 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 uh, of how we see things and the importance of, 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 of the soil. Save the soil. Our soil needs nourishment. Save soil. Let us make it happen. Sadhguru Ji has been born in the world. The world has been born in the world, but the power of the world has been born in the world. I salute you, your energy and your dedication. And my full support of what is needed from the Palestinian side. You honor the people of this country. Thank you. <laughs> I want to thank you very much. And the movement that you have taken up, I could not expect any more God's blessing than that. Sadhguru and this campaign is so important. We are going to save the soil. Do your part. Let's save soil and create a conscious planet. Save soil. Save our soil. Save soil. Sadhguru, <laughs> save soil, my friend. Save soil. Let's make it happen. Antigua and Barbuda is part of the Save Soil mission. We commend you for what you're doing. That is why we are happy to sign the MOU. The science and philosophy. We welcome you in Hyderabad and please show us the right direction towards policy. Save soil. Let's make it happen. It is time to save the soil. Save soil. Save soil. 
safe soil, let's make it happen. We know what we must do, so let's make it happen. Let's make it happen. Let's make it happen. Let's make this happen. Let us make it happen. Let's make it happen. Let's make it happen. Safe soil. Let's make it happen. Just four months ago, soil was not even in the conversation. For the first time, soil has come to the conversation. 193 nations have taken soil as a very serious thing right now. I beseech every one of you that you must keep the soil in conversation for the next few months till the policies are made in the world. Soil is not our property. It's a legacy that's come to us from previous generations and we must pass it on as living soil for future generations. <laughs> Namaskaram. Namaskaram, Sadhguru. Namaskaram, Rakesh ji and uh, everybody else who is there. Namaskaram to you. Welcome uh, to this platform of Indian Council of Agriculture Research for this Azadika Amrit Mahusar. So I again uh, welcome you on behalf of the Indian Council of Agriculture Research and all the agriculture universities for this platform. Uh, friends, as you could see from this very uh, mesmerizing video, of the movement of the safe, safe soil by Sadhguru. I think we can all understand that how this soil is important for our life, how this soil is important for the food security. For every aspect, soil is our, uh, I, I can say, the mother. If you see, there, there are more uh, in the soil, uh, in one teaspoon of the soil, there are more uh, microorganisms than uh, the people on the earth. So this, uh, microorganisms are very important part in the soil. And you can see this soil is nothing but it is a mixture that contains minerals, uh, organic matter and the living, uh, living organisms. So uh, we have to save uh, the soil by any means uh, for uh, everything uh, on, on the earth. So uh, uh, Sadhguru, may I just uh, ask you that what has the uh, what has been the response from the United Nations and the nation governments been like? In what ways is the safe soil working with the various governments and international bodies? Namaskaram to all of you. Well, uh, the response has been uh, phenomenal. The UN agencies, uh, we have three UN agencies as our partners, and about nine UN agencies supporting the movement in so many different ways. So literally almost the entire UN uh, family is mm -hmm. with us and the nations have responded wonderfully well. As you know, in COP15, uh, soil was… Uh, became the main subject because that COP was about desertification. The UN mandate uh, is such that they are supposed to address only desertification, not soil. But in spite of that, the general secretary of the agency took it up, soil. There was some resistance in some quarters, but we went through this well. And how can you address desertification without addressing soil degradation? Simply, uh, this is what it is about. So, we made uh, unique documents for 193 nations based on its latitudinal position, its mm -hmm. uh, soil types and the economic conditions of a given nation and also considering the agricultural traditions of the nation because you cannot change agricultural traditions overnight. Even if you have all the science on your side, you cannot change the agricultural traditions overnight. It's best to learn to work with them. That is the best thing we can do. Now, in many nations, the response is on and already action is on. For example, Guyana has allocated about hundred square kilometers of land for us to demonstrate how this can be done in that region. CARICOM nations have all signed up 
totally now eighty nations have signed up uh, in one level or the other, and about eleven states in India have signed up, and of course the central government, as you saw, Prime Minister's enthusiasm for it. So, there are various kinds of policies that nations are coming up with, which is understandable based on their economic conditions and the level of uh, uh, mm -hmm. aggravation that has happened with soil. So, essentially the response across the world has been good. As you saw, one of the slides talking about China has started its process to, uh, you know, study the soil in that country and uh, come up with a soil policy. EU is uh, looking at that also and Slovakia and Romania, all these places are doing that. Even Azerbaijan is doing a lot of stuff about reviving their soil. These are all at one time, just about hundred, hundred and fifty years ago, they were very fertile lands, but now they've become partial deserts. So desertification and soil degradation cannot be separated, but unfortunately, uh, in the UN mandates, these things are separate. There are two different conventions for soil degradation cannot be separated, but unfortunately, uh, in the UN mandates, these things are separate. There are two different conventions for this. So, it is very important to understand you cannot address climate change or global warming or water stress in the world or food security. You cannot address anything without addressing soil. The body that we carry is soil, the clothes that we wear is soil, the furniture that we are sitting on is soil, everything, our homes are soil, everything is coming from the land. There is nothing that we've imported from anywhere else. Everything that we <laughs> use in our life is from the earth and it's very important, the surface soil which handles agriculture and the food security for the nation which is… which we generally call as topsoil, approximately. I mean, I don't have to give, say these things to all of you, you're all <laughs> experts in the field. Anyway, these fifteen to eighteen inches is our concern because uh, we are severely damaging this with the industrial level of uh, agriculture. Why this happened? For example, if we take India, as you mentioned, uh, it is our pride that it is seventy-five years of independence, Azadi ka Amrut Mahotsav. So, what is it that happened in our country? See, in nineteen… Uh, nineteen forties, thirties, forties and even fifties, we had severe famines in this country. In the last two hundred years since the British landed here, famines have been continuous because they disturbed the basic economic structure of the… Uh, of this uh, nation. So, because of this, there have been continuous famines. Every two years, three years, we've been having very devastating famines. When we say a famine, it's not just a word. Famine is the most painful things that human beings go through and sometimes it takes millions of lives. As 1943, famine took over 3.2 million people in India. So, this is not like war that you just <coughs> die if you, somebody shoots you or bombs you. This is a slow fade, three to four months it takes and the level of degradation that happens to human beings and how a human being loses all sense of humanity and dignity of one's existence simply because they're being starved to death. So, we worked ourselves out of that. We… whatever the green revolution that we did out of that, we have come out of it. Today, we are a food surplus nation, which is a fantastic achievement and also in 1947, the average life expectancy of an Indian person was twenty-eight years of age. Today, it's crossed seventy. One important reason is the food… Uh, the green revolution and the food security that we got. Or in other words, I'm saying all of us are alive today, largely because of fertilizers and chemicals and stuff. Without that, we wouldn't have been able to provide food for this uh, nearly 1.4 billion people today. Having said that, so in… in our were wanting to come out of destroyed our soil in the process. So, in a way, I, if I have to put it in a lighter sense, we… in trying to feed ourselves, we stopped feeding the microbial life, which is the foundational life for our existence. It's not just about food, it's not just about soil, this is the foundational life, because these trillions of species which exist in the soil are the basis of our existence, even in terms of evolution, this level of complexity of life happened only because of the complexity of species that exist in the soil. But today, according to UNFAO, 
where complexity of life happened only because of the complexity of species that exist in the soil. But today, according to UNFAO, we are losing approximately 27,000 species of organisms per year. At this rate, if we go in another 25 to 40 years, we could come to a place where what is a slide right now could go into a tumble and uh, we may not be able to do anything about it once it gets into that mode. So it's extremely important that when we talk about organic content, we're just talking about making sure the organisms are fed because they can only eat organic content. They cannot eat anything else. So making the soil alive, the most important thing that I would like to request and beseech every one of you, <coughs> the scientists, is in our agriculture departments, in our universities, in our research stations, we must start referring to soil as a living entity. It is the largest living system, not only upon this planet, in the known universe it is the largest living system, but unfortunately most nations, nearly eighty-five percent of the nations on the planet still refer to soil as an inert substance that we can fix by adding or subtracting something. Even the soil health cards should include the organic content levels, not just about nitrogen, this, that, that is only about how to exploit the soil. When we, in this country and in this culture, we have referred to soil as our mother, it's not only about exploitation, it is very important to see that how we care for it, because our life depends... how strong our life is, depends on how strong the strength of the soil is upon which we walk and live and eat out of on a <coughs> daily basis. So, the response from the governments, UN agencies and various other private agencies has been phenomenal. We are working with a variety of things. In fact, uh, <laughs> uh, the, it is... Uh, the amount of work that is coming to us is spilling out of our hands because uh, the number of a private agencies which are seeking partnerships and wanting to do many meaningful things that many people are doing. So what uh, I see is there is intention, there are many wonderful things being done. We need to create a scale which is of a global nature so that real solutions happen. This is where it is right now. Thank you, thank you, thank you very much. And yes, we fully agree that we are food uh, sufficient, we are food surplus rather. And we have seen the impact of this food surplus and the advantage of this during this COVID period when everything was logged except the agriculture and how no, nobody faced any shortage. And uh, we must thank the soil that uh, they would give us uh, all this. And we must thank our scientists, our agriculture universities, the scientists of agriculture, uh, Indian Council of Agriculture Research for doing this wonderful. But we have to now think for the sustainable agriculture, as you have rightly told, that uh, whatever has been done has to be now uh, reoriented. So do you think uh, at least in terms of the awareness and the goal set uh, uh, set out uh, at the beginning of the campaign, uh, which we have seen through the video, uh, has been achieved. And what more remains to be done and how can uh, we, the scientists, play an important role uh, in this moment which we have started? So at the beginning of the campaign, our goal was to touch over three billion people because my idea was at least sixty percent of the voting population should become conscious about this. But uh, on twenty-third of June, our... Uh, you know, there's a company or there's an agency which studies the social media and other media impact, and they came out and said, uh, by twenty-third of June, we had touched three-point-nine-one billion people. By now, so after that, still the media and social media things have been on, so it's well over four billion people we have touched which is, uh, I think, well beyond our expectations and the goals we had set for ourselves. That speaks a lot for the enthusiasm and the readiness with which people responded to us, irrespective of which country we went, including uh, Europe, Central Asia, Arabia, and of course India. The response was overwhelming. Most... Uh, <laughs> most of the places, wherever... we always book the largest halls that we have in those cities, but in most places, within hours, these halls were full and nobody imagined that people would be so interested in and concerned about soil. When I started in London, a journalist was interviewing me and she asked me, Sadhguru, why have you... I have been following you for so many years, why have you picked up such an unromantic subject? 
who will… who will be excited about soil? Who is going to support you? <laughs> this is not going to work <laughs> But it has become the largest movement on the planet, people's movement on the planet, over four billion people have been touched. So, this is what I realized in the last uh, thirty years I've been talking about this, but everybody says this is great and they will sleep on it. So what I realized was, when as I spoke to various agencies, UN agencies, agricultural ministries across the world, various ministers, some heads of state and also common people, what I saw was everybody knows what's the problem. And generally everybody knows what is the direction of the solution. But they have been just waiting for uh, an idiot to come and bell the cat. So here I am. <laughs> what to do? <laughs> yes. So, uh... Rakesh ji, you can't agree that I'm an idiot. Come on, <laughs> you can't say yes to that. No, no. So, the, the, thank you very much for uh, responding to that uh, awareness program. But uh, you told uh, some example of uh, Guyana. You have been given some land uh, to demonstrate uh, about this uh, soil other thing. Uh, any such area identified in India also by the government uh, has been given to you? Uh, given to us means we don't want to take the land per se. What we are asking for is to form uh, farmer producer organizations, FPOs, to integrate them and uh, we are seeing how we can bring some son of some funding as a core to attract all the farmers to that, so that they know this money belongs to them, but the money won't go in terms of cash to them, it will go in terms of enhancing the organic content in their lands, which will enhance the thing. But already we have demonstrated this uh, suffic substantially in southern India. Uh, for example, we have worked with about uh, 132,000, one, uh, one lakh 32,000 farmers, and uh, in the… La in… in about five to seven years' time, their incomes have multiplied anywhere between three to eight times over, three hundred to eight hundred percent increase. Recently, the Secretary General of Commonwealth Nations, she… Uh, the Baroness came to visit our farms and she couldn't believe it. The farmers have become so prosperous and the land is so rich and above all, the nutritional value of the food that they grow is so high. 132,000 farmers looks like a large number, but in India that is a small number. Now we are working in the Kaveri Basin where it is 83,000 square kilometers and 5.2 million farmers. It is uh, still in its infancy, but uh, last two years, in spite of the COVID, we have managed to plant about uh, 62 million trees, I think, overall in the farmers' lands and fortunately the Karnataka government now gives subsidy for uh, planting trees in farmers' lands. This is called tree-based agriculture, this is not afforestation. Okay. This is tree-based agriculture, using the foliage of the tree to enhance the land quality and also with a few animals, very easily this can be done. This is not rocket science, this needs a come… Uh, you know, a proper direction and a co relentless commitment to turn this around. In seven to eight years, a maximum of seven to eight years' time, we can easily multiply the farmer's income, take the organic content well over three to four percent and uh, reduce the irrigation levels significantly. We have found when we are raise the organic content to eight to ten percent, the irrigation requirement comes down to thirty percent of what we are using. As you know, India is water stressed. Right now it is expected by 2032, three point five billion people on the planet will be water stressed and agriculture being one of the… or the largest consumer of water, bringing down the usage of water in agriculture is an important part that cannot be done without enhancing the quality of the soil, the aliveness of the soil. So, we have already demonstrated what is missing here is, there is no one large stretch of land. This is individual farmers, 132,000 farmers in different places. Now, in Guyana, they're giving us a hundred square kilometer land. We are also in conversation with uh, the Karnataka government to take up one whole district and do this, or if one district, uh, Chikabalapur district is what we looked at, it is four thousand plus uh, square kilometers, we won't be able to take up and work that. Probably we will work with hundred or two hundred square kilometers, 
to integrate these farmers as one farmer pr uh, producer organization. So when I was in Guyana, the president was very forthcoming and he said, we should do it, we are ready to do it, what do you need? So I said, see, without proper legislations and laws, just trying to do it is not going to work. He asked me what law. See, I said, first of all, the FPO law from India, the legislation which made FPOs, you need to take that. So he said, send me the copy within one week. So it's already done, we just send the copy of the legislation and they have done it there and they are ready to take the next steps. So this level of enthusiasm is there in the governments. Demonstration has already happened, the UN agencies have witnessed this and that is why they are supporting Kaveri Calling in such a big way. Looking at the success of Kaveri Calling on the ground, the central government made detailed project reports for thirteen river basins as we have done in Kaveri. They did thirteen river basins projects and uh, we were trying to push it for action. Just now this year, about three months ago or two months ago, uh, they allocated nineteen thousand crores for these thirteen river basins. If this kind of budget goes in for another eight to ten years, sixty-seven percent of India's land will be well above the crest and very alive. We salute uh, your passion, your dedication, your commitment for this movement. It's a really a great service for the humanity. Now, I, I could see in your video uh, the, the comments, some comments by uh, Professor Ratanlal. He's our colleague uh, from India and he got this World Food Prize. So, uh, do you have any uh, uh, involvement of Dr. Ratanlal in this movement also? Yes, uh, we are very involved with him and also with the organization, what is that, Icha, Ica. Ica, Ica organization. So, we are working with them in the Caribbean area and uh, he's been, uh, uh, in a way, a scientific advisor for various things that we are doing. He's not the only person, we are very deeply engaged with the FAO scientists, but yeah. he's also been one of the mentors uh, to nurture this whole thing. Okay. Uh, Sadhguru, have you uh, already implemented and tried some of the recommendations you are uh, making in the Safe Soil Policy Book? And if See, so, uh, how uh, have these uh, trials uh, turned out? Safe Soil Policy is an academic presentation of what we have done in the last twenty-seven years on ground. Clearly demonstrated that it works, because I wouldn't like to experiment with uh, farmer's life. That's the last thing we would like to do. <laughs> it's well established. We would like uh, some of you to come and visit these farms and see sure. how uh, the farmers' lives have changed and the soil conditions have changed. It'll be great if you can make a study and publish that. Yeah. Uh, today, there is so much talk about soil being a great potential for carbon sink. While you have focused consistently on increasing the soil organic matter, as scientists, uh, we uh, and I said we understand uh, the relationship between uh, soil organic matter. Uh, and uh, the uh, soil organic carbon. That is, uh, soil organic carbon multiplied by 1.73 is your uh, organic matter. Do you want to share with the audience uh, why the emphasis is on soil organic content uh, rather than soil organic carbon? See, soil or the, uh, the carbon dioxide has received too much attention because this is driven by certain activists who are essentially working to bring down the emissions in the world. I am not saying that is not important, that is also a very significant problem, it needs to be worked at. But this is an environmental problem, we are talking about an ecological problem. If we do not separate soil from the other environmental concerns, which will… which will run into the headwind of various businesses like oil industry, uh, you know, automobile industry, coal industry, fertilizer industry, pesticide industry, you will run head-on into all of them and uh, they have not built up overnight, they have taken few decades to come up, now they are not going to go down all of a sudden. But if we enhance the soil organic matter, then naturally the usage of fertilizer will start going down. If you change the farming methods, the usage of all these chemicals will start going down. I am not absolutely against these things, I am not somebody who wants to fight them because we are alive because of them. This is… Uh, I know I've… everybody, we are, all the people who are in this space who call themselves environmental activists are going to hate this. But I am saying this, I am honest about this, all of us as Indians, we are alive because of the Green Revolution 
And yeah. green revolution did not happen without chemicals, without fertilizers. That was the revolution, we started using fertilizer and chemicals. So, now a time has come, we've damaged our soil, we need to reverse that, we need to do more sustainable… sustainable ways of doing it, that's another matter. But for all these things, we first have to be alive, and for that, thanks to Green Revolution <laughs> So, right now, I hear that a lot of people, you know, debunking, people who have done nothing in their lives on social media, debunking uh, our Dr. Swaminathan and saying, he's no good, it's only because of him everything is damaged. This is all, uh, you know, people who have done nothing ever in their lives. So, this is going on all the time, so I keep telling them, see, you're all perfect people. You have never committed a mistake in your life, because you've never done anything in your life. Only if you do something, you can commit a mistake. So, from a famine-ridden nation to bring this nation to food exporting nation is not a simple thing, and that has happened. A whole generation of us have benefited from that, but a time has come to change the mode of function. Now that we are well equipped, economically we are capable of turning this around, this is the time to turn it around. So, having said that, the important thing why we are talking about organic matter, not about carbon is, this is about soil, this is not about air pollution. But if you… if you raise the soil organic ma matter, the amount of carbon that it will sequester is quite phenomenal. I… Uh, uh, you know, uh, what we have uh, done is for the Kaveri calling, we… we are looking at planting 2.42 billion uh, trees or, uh, you know, to grow that many trees in the Kaveri Basin. So, the UN agencies have calculated and say, if you plant this many trees, 9 to 12 trillion liters of water will be sequestered, 200 to 300 million tons of COT will be sequestered. So, if it ha… if this happens in thirteen river basins, you can imagine what will happen. If it happens across the country, we have solved the problem, all right? Without enhancing the soil biome, sequestering carbon just by this and that technology is not the answer, because carbon is not our enemy. We are all carbon life. Life on this planet is a chain of carbon. In this chain, the life cycle, or the carbon cycle, soil is the most important link and that is wearing thin, very thin, dangerously thin. So, if that has to revive, we need soil organic matter which will naturally handle the soil uh, carbon, but soil carbon is not our business. Our business is to keep the soil alive and naturally if the soil is alive, it will sequester substantial amounts of carbon whatever different numbers that people are throwing out is fine, but will it sequester or not, there is no question about it. It sequesters enormous amount of carbon. Above all, we have to put back as much green leaf as possible, whether it comes as crops or cover crops, as bushes or trees, whatever, we need more green leaf because this is oxygen manufacturing factories. And uh, this photosynthesis on the planet has sunk significantly. Uh, in the last thousand years, they say eighty-five percent of photosynthesis has been removed, so we've destroyed all oxygen manufacturing uh, plants and we are trying to ca catch, <laughs> uh, what do you say, carbon dioxide molecules in the air. I'm not trying to make fun out of it, I know that is also important, but it is very important we enrich the atmosphere with oxygen and that is only possible with lot of green leaf, Agricultural lands must be covered with green leaf. Either crop must be there, or cover crop must be there, or partially planted trees must be there. In some way, green leaf must be there, which will in turn sequester carbon, and in turn keep the soil alive, and in turn replenish the soil with the leaf that falls down and a few animals, because the only two sources of organic content on the planet are plant life and animal life. I'm saying this, I don't have to say this to the scientists that you are, but uh, there is a problem among the young people, wherever I go, they say, Sadhguru, my friend has invented an app, it can solve all these problems. So, <laughs> whatever app you have, it doesn't matter what app you have, organic content comes only from plant life and animal life. Today, our farms have become like this, there is no plant life, there is no animal life, there are only machines roaming the lands, this is not good because the machines don't put back anything, they only destroy by opening it up. 
So I'm even talking to various robotic companies to bring light machines which will work day and night, where if you have to apply fertilizer or pesticide, <clears throat> It can apply in very micro doses in a doctored manner where it is necessary, not bringing it in airplanes and dumping pesticides and vermicides all across the land and de colossal destruction. So we need to look at all these things. Right now we are studying these possibilities of building robotic machines where it is needed in the future because we have made a kind of survey with the farmers. What we have found is right now sixty-two percent of India's population is in farming. But when we did a survey, we found not even two percent of the farmers want their children to become farmers. How are we going to feed these populations in another twenty-five years when this generation passes? So, we just don't have any plan. Robotics is very, very important to free human hands to do something else. And for everything right now, there is a human hand. And for everything, there are large destructive machines. We have to build very small, small micro machines which will go around. As bugs and insects go around, we can make machines which will go around and similar kind of reverse job for agriculture. And uh, this is very important step to do. And if I have to, if I can, I know you're all scientists, but uh, if I can tell you a story, if you, if you permit me, I'll tell you a story. Yeah, please. <laughs> Uh, yes, you have rightly told uh, that we, we have to go for the precision agriculture, the, the use of robotics or whatever you have told. There is nothing but we are also promoting, uh, uh, promoting the use of for this uh, precision and digital agriculture. And uh, until unless you use the technology, I think we cannot uh, survive in the future. So, uh, in the same series, I can tell you that Indian Council of Agriculture Research, through its uh, one of the very important project, NICRA project, National Innovation on Climate Resilient Agriculture. Is doing a lot of uh, interventions. Mulching also we are uh, promoting for the farmers. Uh, Sadhguru, can, uh, can you respond please? In your experience, how should the farming community in India approach this problem of soil degradation? And what uh, should as, a, as we as a scientists do to support both the governments and the farmers to reverse the degradation? See, one uh, socio-economic situation that we must realize which affects farming is m many, many farmers, I cannot tell you what is the percentage, but a large percentage of farmers on doing agriculture like it's the end game. Yeah. Because their children have already gotten college education and they are looking for jobs elsewhere or they are already employed somewhere else. So children are not coming back to the farm, they know that. So they are doing it like an end game till the real estate prices go up and they can sell the land or do something else but they are not looking at continued or sustained agriculture. So this is a socio-economic situation in the country because we have what is called as uh, compulsory education where children go to school, academic school, where there is no farming, there is no any education about farming. So they… Ca even if they just finish their twelfth standard, they're already seventeen, eighteen years of age. So, both physically and mentally, they are not equipped to go back to farming, they all want to move into something else. Yes, sixty-two percent of the population need not be in farming, we could reduce that, but this is a colossal migration without the necessary organizational change. This could seriously affect us. So, what do we have to do? The most important thing is, farming should become a lucrative process. At least, a farmer should earn as much as a doctor or an engineer or a lawyer or whatever other professions which drive young people to urban centers, at least that much they must earn. Otherwise, in another thirty years' time, there will be hardly anybody living on the farms. Everybody will move into urban centers, which could be disastrous for the country and for the world in many different ways. We as a nation have a latitudinal spread from Kanyakumari to Himalayas. The latitudinal spread that we have and the types and the variety of soils and climates that we have, we can almost grow any crop that grows anywhere in the world. That is the capability we have. And we still have sixty percent of the population who have skills in agriculture, which is not easy to teach to new set of people. So, at a time like this, if we come up with a very strong, dynamic and revolutionary agricultural policies, we can make India as a breadbasket to the world. Now you have seen the value of a nation which provides food for the world, 
a war happens, the whole world is supporting one nation simply because they have been the source of food. Uh, <laughs> so this is the value of food. So it's very important that we not only grow food for ourselves, we can grow food for the world, at least the Asian part of the world or Arabia which is close to us and which is incapable of growing its own food for, better, for the kind of uh, terrains that they have. To large parts of the world, we can provide food because very few nations have the depth of agricultural knowledge that our farmers have. But unfortunately, they look uneducated, they may not be able to articulate what is what, but if you really sit with a local farmer, which I know all of you know, the what he knows there, it is not intellectual, he just knows everything that he needs to know to grow a crop. I've… Uh, you know, like even if somebody does uh, a big MBA or even MSc in agriculture, they may not be able to grow successfully crops on the land, but this illiterate farmer knows exactly what to do and because it's very intrinsic traditional knowledge, we just have to you know, tweak him up with modern technology, modern knowledge, scientific knowledge that all of you have. If this can be transmitted or, tra you know, transferred to the farm level, I know efforts are being made from the universities, but I think more uh, as a policy that this must go to everybody if this happens. And this cannot happen unless we incentivize. We have to incentivize because right now farmers' economy is such, if you shake it a little bit, the whole thing will collapse. It is in that condition. So little bit happens, he has to sell the land and go. That is the kind of condition they are in. So strong incentives which are production oriented, not simply waving off loans and stuff like that, but production oriented, if you do this, 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 you will get this much money. This is what a model we are trying to set up. We are looking for funding from various agencies. If that comes up, we want to set up an FPO with ten to twenty-five thousand farmers covering let's say hundred square kilometers or two hundred square kilometers of land and then see how this main fund that we have put there becomes an attraction for the farmers, that it is their money. It is their money hundred percent, there is no strings to it, only thing is, it is not given as cash. It will be given to improve the land condition and uh, how they grow their crops, definitely which will increase their income. Right now, wherever they have put this uh, tree-based agriculture, what we are seeing is, every twelve years when they crop these trees, even partially, the amount of money that they are getting is equivalent to the amount they would get if they sell the land. So every twelve years, they can sell the land and still keep the land. Once there are trees on the land, they are not going to leave that land and go to the city because tree is a standing wealth. Yes. Very good uh, moment and very good uh, initiative. I can uh, again compliment uh, your effort, your thinking, and your uh, innovation. So you have been traveling, uh, as we could see from the video, uh, non-stop post rally also, uh, where uh, all you have uh, been journeyed and what has been the outcome, uh, what has been the response from various state governments, and how do you see? the journey towards implementing a comprehensive soil policy for India. So, uh, p post uh, this uh, hundred day journey, I've been… Uh, you know, these days you like… Uh, right now, uh, I, I don't know where uh, you are, sir, Rakesh uh, Ji? I'm from Indian Council of Agriculture Research. No, I'm heading the agriculture education. In, in Delhi. city are you right now? Delhi? New Delhi, it? New Delhi. Okay. So, you're in Delhi, I'm here, uh, so… Either you have… you have traveled to Isayoga Center or I have traveled to Delhi so, or we met in between, but uh, here we are talking to each other. So yeah. my travels after the hundred day journey has not all been physical, there has been a series of Zoom calls where we have been talking to various agricultural ministries. Slovakia has gone ahead and framing a policy, European Union is doing that. And uh, I traveled physically to Trinidad and Guyana uh, and uh, was in touch with all the CARICOM nations. Uh, immediately after my trip, they had a CARICOM uh, meeting uh, the week after I left. So there, they are taking up the soil policy for the entire region because right now they are importing uh, over ninety percent of their food requirement from outside and the food that is being dumped in those Caribbean nations is very low quality food from advanced nations and uh, forty-two percent of uh, Caribbean male population is diabetic and uh, they are really concerned about it. Now they've kind of woken up, 
Some of these countries have uh, now recently found oil, so they're economically a little better. They want their people to eat better, they want to grow their own food. They have enormous land. Uh, countries like Guyana, Suriname, they have enormous land and they can grow food for the Caribbean nations, island nations. Unfortunately, because of forced food practices, none of the island nations are fish-eating nations. They've all become beef-eating nations because somebody wants to sell their beef to them. So, uh, we are starting a movement to bring back vegetables and fish into their diet. As a part of this, uh, <laughs> some of the nations, we are sending Indian chefs from here because part of the population is Indian there, Indian origin. And uh, we are sending Indian chefs because their cooking methods are very simple. Uh, they don't know how to make vegetarian meals properly. So to Indian chefs who will go and demonstrate in hotels and in other public places how to make uh, fish and vegetarian dishes in a tasty manner so that the population will take to it. So this is a multi-pronged effort because without people's support, nothing will be successful. Yes, thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, friends, we can also understand for uh, changing climate, as we have seen, uh, just two days back I was reading in the newspapers, in European countries also you can see how the climate change has affected. There are droughts, there are a lot of unwanted uh, uh, temperature rise. And uh, I think for all that, we have to take care of uh, this soil, which again is a very important uh, constraint for our uh, growth, for our food security. Uh, you can uh, see from his uh, talk that a well-managed soil can really uh, take a lot of carbon from the, uh, from the atmosphere uh, in the soil. So that can really uh, help us. So it's, it has multiple advantages. And I think uh, we, we, we can take a commitment uh, doing this Azadi Garnet Mahosav 75 years that yes, we will make all efforts to save our soil so that we can save our uh, lives, we can save our humanity, we can really save uh, a, a lot of uh, other uh, uh, unforeseen things. On, and we can prepare ourselves for the future. We, we cannot predict the future, but at least we can prepare ourselves for the future. <laughs> So, uh, one really, thing I would uh, like to s at this point, one thing I would like to say, sir, in the Western cultures, everybody is too concerned about global warming and uh, carbon sequestration, these things, they, these are important, but we must look at the source of this. One of the biggest problems that United States and Europe is right now facing is the heat and in turn, the fires that are happening, large-scale fires. When I was in United States, uh, you know, just about uh, fifteen days ago, I was there and uh, as I was there, I asked how many fires are happening right now. They said eighty-three live fires are on right now in United States, which will take fifteen days to one month to control, minimum. Eighty-three fires are going on in United States simultaneously. I… I had not imagined that many. I thought one or two or three would be there. Eighty-three fires were going on. And so it happened in Europe also, France and Italy and Spain, all of them were having large-scale fires. So what… what is global warming? There are many ways to look at it. I know you're all of your scientists, but my simple way of looking at it is, if you go and touch plowed land on a hot day, what is the temperature of the soil? With your own hands, you, you don't need a, a… a barometer or a, te a thermometer, just touch it with your hands, what's the temperature? There is grass growing on the land, what is the temperature? There are bushes, what is the temperature? Under the tree, what is the temperature? In my experience, I find the distinction in India could be anywhere between eight to twelve degrees centigrade from open… La open soils which are in the sun to what is under a shade of a tree. So this is global warming, eight degrees, twelve degrees. This is huge global warming. And once this happens, once the land is plowed and left open, the moisture content in the soil has gone down because there is not enough organic content for the organisms to thrive. Without the organisms and the fluff that they create in the soil, there is no uh, water holding capability for the soil. As we said, if we plant this many trees, they are calculating that it could sequester nine to twelve trillion liters of water. So water is there in the soil. If there is enough water in the soil, fires won't happen as they're happening right now. The soil has become dry, every stick, every leaf catches fire because there is no humidity in the soil. 
So without bringing shade, without bringing green leaf back on the soil, there is no way we can handle global warming because the radiation that the soil creates is definitely creating a lot. People are focusing only on the emissions. Emissions are an important issue. We are doing things to bring down the emissions in the world, that is fine. But war is a big emission. First thing is we must stop that. Look, <laughs> for a automobile that you drive, everybody is checking your scooter or moped or a motorcycle that you ride, how much emission is coming. Look at the tanks and the jets and the missiles that are being fired, the amount of emissions that they're creating, the amount of heat that they're creating. First thing is that, that they must stop. The same nations which are talking about uh, stopping all this, they're always busy supplying military equipment to everybody else. Military equipment is a massive uh, <laughs> emission thing. So, bringing back green cover is very, very important. We cannot bring back forests in countries like India because the population pressure is there. We must do tree-based agriculture. We have to bring trees on the land. In this, Karnataka has been a pioneering effort because they gave the subsidy, 125 rupees subsidy spread over four years, where if a farmer just takes a picture and puts it on the website, the money will go straight to his account. And Karnataka chief minister, the pre present chief minister and the past chief minister, both of them have been very dynamically supporting this movement. And the success of this depends on the political leadership's determination. Uh, when you asked where, how are the states, almost every state publicly they have declared that they are hundred percent with this, but this is a kind of a, you know, between center and state. Center is examining this. We are beginning to work with the Niti Aayog. Uh, we hope in the next two to three months, we will come up with a economic policy for the cover crops, which will make a lot of difference in India, because in the summer months, India is looking like a brown desert. If you bring cover crops, significant difference will happen to the soil. Every year, if you grow a cover crop and plow it back into the soil for two, three years time or maybe four years time, we can get the soil about three percent organic content because each cover crop could add anywhere between uh, one to one point five inches, one to one and a half inches of humus on a yearly basis. This could make a lot of differ difference. So many things are being done, but uh, organizations like yours, uh, if you stand up, you have uh, more credibility than me. Uh, people ask me, what is my qualification? I have no qualification. With all your qualifications, <laughs> but you must take this up and take this ahead. I've brought attention to it, but ultimately policy will happen because of all of you. Thank you very much. But for person is more important than the education. Your commitment is more important than the education. Uh, one of our uh, top uh, soil scientists, uh, Dr. Ashok Patra, just if you permit, I can take one question. So, he is uh, the director of the Indian uh, Institute of Soil in ICA. So, to meet the food production targets of India, fertilizers use is very important. Best management of organic and inorganics are very important in that context. What is your opinion in this scenario to enhance the organic content in soil? As uh, I've already said, I'm not against anything. I'm not anti this, anti that. See, these kind of things, urban people will talk like this, let's do organic farming. If we eliminate all fertilizer and uh, chemicals from the agriculture tomorrow morning, our food production on the planet will come down to twenty-five percent of what we are producing right now. I am a... I am a well-experienced farmer myself, I've lived on the land, I've grown crops. If we do not put fertilizer and pesticide, yield will come down to twenty-five percent, that is death for humanity. So, we must be very careful in saying these things. I am not talking about organic farming, I am not talking about any type of farming. Yeah. What kind of farming a farmer does, leave it to him. Only thing we are saying is just enhance the organic content, incentivize enhancement of organic content, which will make the soil alive. As the organic content increases, the need for fertilizer will start coming down. I am never talking about no fertilizer business. If you need to use it, you must use it. It's like you may eat good food, but still if something is lacking, you take a vitamin pill. It is just that we must treat the soil as we treat our body because our body and soil are not two different things. We must use chemicals in a doctored manner, not in a mass manner as we're doing right now. So, 
It is a very wrong notion that people have, we can just eliminate chemicals and grow everything naturally. Well, we will pay a huge price if we attempt anything like that. It's very, very important that we approach this judiciously and sensibly. That's correct. We have to uh, maintain a balance. So, uh, thank you very much, uh, uh, Sadhguru, and uh, I thank your all team uh, for this excellent arrangement, for giving the time, for uh, making it possible to have your views. And I request uh, my colleague, Mr. Ravi Prakas, who, uh, who did this contact, uh, to uh, please uh, say a word of uh, thanks. Uh, Mr. Ravi Prakas, he is the director of the International Relations. If I can, if I can take a few seconds, sir. Please, I would please. like to request all of you at this organization, uh, all of you scientists who are hugely qualified, uh, your voices should rise. If you can, all of you can open a Twitter account, we will support you. Please, every day scientists should say something about the soil scientifically, so right. that uh, the government and everybody else who is in the polity and also the people understand this is a genuine concern, this is not just a social movement, this is a genuine concern and there is substantial scientific backbone to it. I would beseech all of you really? scientists and all really of really you really in different organizations to do this on a regular basis, till it is done, it is not done, only campaign is done. The work is not done, the work has to start now. So, yeah. till it is done, another <laughs> few <laughs> years, if we keep up this thing, our voices high, especially qualified voices, if you keep them high, I am sure we will achieve these targets. Thank you sure. very much. Please, sure, sure. We, we, we promise we will do uh, the, uh, whatever possible is from uh, Aisha's side. So, Mr. Ravi Pagas, please. Uh, thank you, sir. And uh, Namaskaram, Sadhguru. Namaskaram. On behalf of the entire ICR and the National Agriculture Research System Fraternity, it is my absolute honor and pleasure to express our profound gratitude uh, for being with us today, despite your hectic schedule. Uh, we consider ourselves to be extremely fortunate and uh, are truly delighted to be in your presence, Sadhguru. Uh, we really had a scintillating, fruitful and uh, captivating interaction. Uh, Sadhguru's Safe Soil Movement is a timely reminder to the humanity to unite together to avert the imminent crisis of rapid degradation of the soil, which is the very basis of all life on the planet, including ours. As you rightly said, Sadhguru, that soil is not our property, but it's a legacy that belongs to the next generation. Uh, with these words, I once again thank Sadhguru for his benevolent presence and useful insights in suggesting pragmatic solutions to save soil. I also would like to thank Dr. Agarwal for his valuable contribution yeah. and beautifully curating this session. A profound note of thanks to all the distinguished invitees for joining this session. Last but not the least, a big thanks to Isha team for their constant support and guidance to make this wonderful session a possibility for all of us. So I conclude by saying, uh, thank save, you, Ravi. Soil. save soil, let's make it happen. Yeah. Pranam. Pranam thank you, Ravi. And uh, I thank all my colleagues, uh, Deputy Director Journals, our Professor R.B. Singh, um, many Vice Chancellors. Uh, I, I see a lot of uh, top officers, top soil scientists uh, of uh, our uh, India uh, who have joined in a big number. And this was also live streamed uh, through the YouTube, uh, which has been uh, seen by many students and uh, many other uh, audience. So thank you Sadhguru and thanks to everybody. Namaskar. Thank you very much. Namaskar. Namaskar.